Good morning. Are the class reps here? Are the class reps here? Stand up. Where's our class reps? Stand up. Give your class reps a round of applause. You have a week extra. <laughs> okay. You have a week extra thanks to your class reps. Um, the, the, the stuff is due in uh, Friday, 26th of October, 5 p.m. Don't be late. I uh, got a couple of people, a couple of people uh, sending me emails about, a um, couple of people sending me emails about when is it due and all this sort of stuff. Don't send it in at 5.01 and send me an email going, oh, I, I was only a little bit late. It's a computer. It doesn't care. Okay. Just, it, 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 they're marked as late and they're not marked. Okay. So your case studies, if they're late, they're not marked. Um, so please do your best. Um, uh, my granny ate my homework, etc. excuses aren't accepted. Um, so, so that's that. Second thing in, the case studies are, are, are going really well. We've graded about half of the first weeks and they look great. Um, you, you're, you're not only a very smart class, you're also very innovative, which is really, really nice to see. The third, um, the third uh, announcement is that this week, uh, or tomorrow, is the, um, the open day. So lectures are cancelled. So I'm sure most lecturers have reminded you of this, but lectures are cancelled. So you, you and tutorials as well. So you you'll miss your tutorial this week unless you go to one today. <laughs> Somebody go yay! <laughs> okay. Finally, um, is there anybody who didn't get an email about the uh, student uh, assessment? It's a student assessment of the teaching, because I got a couple of emails of people who. Yeah, the evaluation. You, no, this entire class did not get it. Okay, I'm thinking of a word that begins with F and ends in uck. All right, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll email them and sort it out. Um, so roughly, of the 350 people in this class, we're roughly thinking that approximately 349 of them didn't get the email. Okay, thank you very much, folks, uh, and then we'll move on. This is, uh, this is a very interesting topic. Uh, but if you've got any questions, please shoot me a text message. Um, I'll get to them in a little while. Let me just get through some material first. This is a really, really interesting lecture. This is one of the things that I care most about um, uh, in, in economics. The reason that I care a lot about this is because it's fundamentally important, okay? It is, it is fundamentally important. What, we're, what, we, do, what we do today uh, is, is going to shape the rest of the course. So we're looking at growth and distribution. Growth matters. Growth matters because it helps living standards. That's why it matters. Distribution matters because some people have more than others. Okay? In fact, I would hazard a guess that you are from families of people who have more than others. I would, I would hazard that, that, that guess and I think I would be confirmed in that. You are the children very much of the upper middle class and the middle class itself, the middle middle class. Most of, the, most of you. Some of you. Some of you will have come from poorer backgrounds. Some of you will come from very, very rich backgrounds. But by and large, most of you are from the middle class. What does that mean? It means that you grew up with a certain amount of stability in your life. It means that you took basic health care, basic dental care, the, uh, the right to have a car, the right to have a holiday, the right to uh, live and work in a clean place. You took that for granted. That wasn't even a thing for you. Okay? It wasn't even a thing. It was assumed. A bit like the plumbing in your house. And this is not the case for most people in the world. It's not the case for about 5 billion people in the world. It's also not the case for other people in this classroom. There is a certain income distribution in this classroom, and we'll talk about that today. So here's, what I, here's the three things I want you to learn today. Number one, growth is a very subjective term. It's given a hard mathematical form in economics, but it is a very subjective term. What we want growth for is not to grow the economy. We want growth because growth is ca 
very closely correlated with living standards. That's why we care about growth. It is true, because it's true, it's a tautological statement, that growth does not lift everyone out of poverty. It lifts lots of people out of poverty, but not everybody. And finally, it is true that growth and stability are incompatible. You will all, or most of you, have stopped growing. Your heights, your heights are, are, are fixed for the rest of your life, unless you have some kind of accident. Therefore, the, the value of your height at today, relative to tomorrow, relative to the next day, is roughly constant. Okay? That's stability. Your, your, your five-year-old nephew or your five-year-old niece, their height is not a constant. It is growing over time. Okay? So your height is a stable value. Your nephew or your niece's height is not. They're not the same thing. And as a matter of fact, they're incompatible. Okay? Now, there are different ways to understand growth. There are different uh, uh, um, theories of it. The first, the first way to understand it is what's called Say's Law. And here's, here's, here's the, the classical interpretation. So this is, this is basically the work of Adam Smith, the work of uh, Alfred Marshall. They said, OK, how do you get growth? How do you get an economy to grow? How do you get an economy to grow? Well, they said, right, supply creates its own demand. Say's law. Would everybody please write that down? Say's law. Supply creates its own demand. Say's law is an incredibly powerful concept. It says that if you have a lot of people in a room and only half of them are employed in a given moment, the way to get them employed is to reduce their wage. Okay? Is to reduce their wage. Any glut, a glut is an excess, any glut will be taken care of by price movements. Just drop your wage to the point that someone will hire you, even of course if that wage is zero. That's a glut. You, you reduce the wage. Another way to think about it is if you've got too much stuff in a shop, what do you do? You have a sale. You allow the price mechanism to do this. If you believe Say's law, and there are good, there's good evidence, by the way, to believe it. If you believe Say's law, then you believe that the government is a problem because the government stops the movement of prices. The government regulates prices. It enforces some prices. It incentivizes other people to set prices too high and it stops people from moving prices too low. Okay? Therefore, if you believe Say's law, the real world implication of what you believe is that the role of policy is to get out of the way of this price correction. Just get out of the way. Just get out of the way. Minimum wage, waste of time. You don't need a minimum wage. Why? People should work. People should work for what they think they can earn. So if you think, if you think that you're happy to work for two euros an hour, you should be allowed to do that. Okay? Hands up here who would reduce the minimum wage in Ireland. You would reduce it. It's eight euros. Let's just say it's eight euros. Who would, would you reduce it now? Hands up. Put them up high, because I can't really see the ones at the back. One, two, three, four, five, about, I don't know, 5% of the class. Who wouldn't reduce the minimum wage? The rest of the class. So 90, 95% of the class wouldn't reduce the minimum wage. That's an interesting point. Okay. That's an interesting point. Okay. Um, so in a sense, then, you believe a Keynesian story. Okay. You believe the Keynesian story. And the Keynesian story is essentially that aggregate or effective demand, okay, and effective demand is what happens when you buy something. It must be controlled to ensure high levels of employment and output. It must be controlled, okay? So that means you don't let the wage drop to two euros. You keep it at eight. It means you, when you see the economy fal faltering, you in inject more money via monetary policy, or you buy more stuff via fiscal policy, or you cut taxes, yeah? You ensure high levels of employment and output. This is the Keynesian theory. It, was, it, it predominated economics from the 1950s to the 1970s or so, uh, and it's elaborated by people like Minsky, uh, Tobin, and Godley. Okay? Now, the problem with Keynesian theory was it wasn't able to explain the post-gold standard era. Um, post the 1960s, basically, Say's law came back. 
Say's law was buried by, by John Maynard Keynes. He said supply doesn't create its own demand. If supply created its own demand, there would be no unemployment, but there is. It's not the case that people are saying, well, I woke up today and decided I wouldn't go to work. The truth is there's just no jobs for them. It's not the, the demand side of the economy is faltering. You must help demand as well as supply. So um, they essentially resumed it. They, 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 they exhumed Say's Law in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, and they, they literally used rocket science. They used the mathematics of how to shoot a rocket from, from Washington to Vladivostok. Um, Keynes was buried and we had what's called monetarism, where, you can, where the belief was you could control the economy via monetary policy. All you needed to do was keep the price level stable, get the government out of the way, and the problem would solve itself. That's monetarism. Okay? This reigned. This was the reigning economic orthodoxy when I was in college, um, and now it's not. Now it's falling apart. Since 2008, the wheels have fallen off the bus. It's no longer acceptable to tell the Irish people uh, in, with a 14% unemployment rate that, yeah, you're just choosing not to work. Yeah? You're just choosing not to work. You've decided to wake up this morning and not work. Or there's been some kind of a productivity shock. That's not the case. That's not the case at all. The, tru the truth about it is the wheels have fallen off the bus. Lord uh, Skidelsky, who is John Maynard Keynes' biographer, wrote a book last year, and it was called The Return of the Master. And basically what it means is that Keynes is back. His theories are back. So, that's fine. That's fine. But what has that got to do with growth? If you believe that the world is described by John Maynard Keynes, then you believe that the way to, to affect growth is for interventionist government policy. That's one way to do it. If you believe that the way to encourage growth is to get the public sector out of the way and allow the private sector to innovate, then you believe Jean-Baptiste Say. Okay? And the man himself has a, lovely, has a lovely quote. And he says, It is worthwhile to remark that a product is no sooner created than it from that instant affords a market for other products to the full extent of its own value. In other words, supply creates its own demand. You can read the rest of the quote yourself. And you can click that link, by the way, and that'll take you to Say's big, big book and his big masterpiece. If you're interested in the, uh, if you're interested in the history of economic thought at all, you can do a lot worse than just reading the great men themselves and the great women. So let's let's take this little model here. On the on the uh, on the y-axis we have output, economic output, perhaps proxied by GDP, and on the uh, the uh, on the x-axis rather we've got output. On the y-axis, we've got um, the real wage, which is the wage te that, that takes account of price levels. This, this black line here is demand, but it's, it's not regular demand. It's effective demand. This is what's actually bought and actually sold every day. That's effective demand. It's different from the aggregate demand you studied last year. This blue line here is a wage curve. Okay? The intersection of these curves defines the real wage and the output level. So for a given real wage here, you'll get this amount of output. So what happens if you drop the real wage in this situation? If you drop the real wage, say to here, okay, so if you start off and you're here, so if you drop the real wage, you increase output. That's what this is telling you, okay? In this situation, if you drop real wages, okay, if you drop, if you drop wages, you actually end up reducing output. There are two lines. There are two lines here. This line here, this line here is called a wage-led regime. And this line here is called a profit-led regime. The idea is if you give more money to workers, if you give more money to workers, you increase their wage. In this situation, you don't get any more output. If you increase people's wages here, you do get more output. Yeah, they buy more stuff. So, which one do you believe? Do you believe that the world is a profit-led regime or a wage-led? The idea is, again, for profit-led regime, if you increase wages, wages go up, okay, then output goes up. Up. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's an arrow. I'm doing my best here. And here, if, if, here, if wages go up, uh, then profits go down. Output goes down, rather. Okay. Sorry, folks, I'm trying to do this with a little touchpad thing. It's not working. Output goes down. 
So which, which one? Which one? Okay, the red line here shows a pro-cyclical real wage. In other words, the wage goes with the cycle. With the cycle. This might seem a bit abstract to you, but if you believe the world is a, if you believe that the Celtic Tiger, for example, was a profit-led regime, in other words, if you give more money to capitalists, they'll invest more, and that'll lead to growth, and that'll lead to development, then what should you do? You should lower corporation tax. If you believe that, the real, that, that it's a, a, a wage-led regime, and giving people money is better, then the, the instantiation of that, the public policy thing that you should do, is wipe out everybody's debt. Is just take the mortgage market and say, hey, you've got a mortgage of 200,000, cut it in half. Because what have you done there? You've reduced everybody's monthly payments massively. You've hammered capitalists, because you've told, just told a lot of banks, listen lads, you're not getting your money back, effectively. Yeah? Um, but you can do that. And you've increased everybody's real wage, you've decreased their, their, their aggregate level of debt, and on they sail. Can you see, can you see that the two, different, the two different regimes, depending on where you actually are in reality, they, they, they give you two completely different policies. And this is important. Okay? So let me give you an example. Ireland in the boom. So 1997 to 2002. This is the basic Celtic Tiger period. Okay? We saw real wage appreciation. Real wages exploded. Uh, child benefit exploded. Um, uh, not literally, uh, but it, it went up. Uh, public sector pay, that did explode. That went way, way, way up. Okay? The real wage appreciation across the board. Um, so, okay, what happens to the components of aggregate demand? What happened to C and I and G and X minus M, which all of you now know intimately since you chanted it last week? So this is what happened, basically. The blue line there at the very bottom, that's personal consumption expenditure. That's C. Okay? The red line there, um, that's uh, G. These are in, these are, this is quarterly data in hundreds of millions. Okay? So what you can see there is, is uh, you know, this is uh, uh, 10 billion. 10,000 million. That's 10 billion there in a quarter. Okay, so 10 billion spent on personal, cons personal consumption. I don't know, 12 billion spent by the government. Here is um, gross domestic fixed capital formation. That's investment. That's I. Okay, and this here is X minus M, exports and imports. When you add these, th these four lines up, you get gross domestic product, GDP. That's what you get when you add up these lines in a particular direction. So this particular, this particular point, you just add these up, yeah? Add up these values and you get the, you get the aggregate value of output. What is this telling you? It's telling you first that all the components are going up at the same time, okay? All the components are going up. But what did we do in Ireland during this period? Well, we did a couple of things. The first is we joined the single market. We joined the European single market. That was the first thing. The second thing that we did was <coughs> we, we opened ourselves up to vast amounts of uh, international uh, uh, money, basically, coming from the IFSC. The third thing we did is we, we became one of the largest FDI hubs in the world, the largest F, uh, foreign direct investment hubs in the world. We gave free education to people like me who would have never gotten a free, uh, and I would have never have gone to college without free education. Without a doubt, I would not have gone to college without free education. Um, and we brought back a generation of people who had previously emigrated. And this all contributed to an enormous boom. Now this wasn't the boom that you grew up in, by and large. You grew up in a boom that was largely built on fake money. This was a real boom. It genuinely happened. It was accompanied with very low inflation, and it was honestly a miracle. Um, and it was a great, uh, I wasn't here for most of it. Uh, but that's important. So what I'm saying to you here is that we had a load of extremely supply side says law type policies. The government did its best to get out of the way uh, it, as much as it could in these situations. And the government also got, made itself a lot bigger. Um, it, it gave itself a lot of um, handouts and rewards for this success. But what does this prove? What does this prove? This proves nothing, folks. This proves nothing. There is no template for growth. There's no way to make the economy bigger and better in each, 
uh, individual time. And frankly, frankly, there is no menu. There's no rule. Okay, here's the big question. Why are we so rich? Why are they so poor? One of the, one of the things that, that we tend to get upset about in Ireland is that we, are, we get run by the troika. These guys, they tell us what to do and you know, they, they push us around and you know, they're German and we don't like Germans and all this type of stuff. Um, if there are any German students here, I like you, I like you fine. Um, but but uh, the truth about it is that the, basically, basically the Troika, the Troika is, is composed of three elements, the IMF, the European Commission and the European Central Bank. The IMF, many people have said, look, if we went into the IMF on its own, we would have done a lot better. We would have got a lower interest rate. We could have uh, uh, burnt some bondholders. We definitely wouldn't be on the hook for the banks, and we could have had some stimulus. All that is being vetoed by the other two partners. Why don't we go into the IMF on its own? And the answer from somebody in the IMF was, we are not here to bail out one of the richest countries in the world that destroyed itself. We are here to help Haiti. We are not here to help Ireland. Yeah? That's their argument, and that is true. That is very true. So the IMF is there, is there to incentivize the development of poorer countries. It's not there to help Ireland uh, pay for overplay public servants. Although it has helped, so thanks very much, Mr. Chopra. So the basic facts that we need to explain. Can we explain the growth in per capita income and output? which is dy, the change in output, divided by dt, the change in time. Demographic changes, dn, so n is the population, divided by dt. Can we explain why this has exploded? Do any of you have a sense of why there were more babies born this year in Ireland than any year since 1891? Is it just because TV is really crap? I don't know. Depreciation. Um, we have to explain why a building like this is built for a hundred years. It's not built, this, is, this building will be here in a hundred years time. Most of us will be dead, but there'll still be people sitting in here. Okay? But 200 years, probably not. Yeah? Capital accumulation and destruction. The wealth of the nation dropped by something like 26 billion euros last year. The aggregate financial wealth. And financial flows. Why does money flow in and out of the economy? Well, there's a very simple growth story that I want to tell you now. And if you've got any questions, please feel free to shoot me a text message. Message even. The first is the Harrod Domar model. So these were two guys. <coughs> these were two guys who started asking themselves, well, what is it about the economy that we can explain? Well, let's call this thing G, uh, the growth of uh, government expenditure. Okay. We'll call that level G, okay? And um, I think, I think what, we'll, what we'd like to see, what we'd like to see maybe is uh, maybe a simple expansion of, of, growth, of a growth rate. Can I borrow some paper and a pen? I didn't bring any. Just some white A4 paper and a pen. Just one person. One will explain it. Thank you. Maybe two sheets. When you see um, G, okay, when you see G, select the PC now. When you see G there, that's the growth rate over time. Okay. Check the visualizer. No? Yes. That's the growth rate over time. G, G, can you all see that? Yeah? Everybody see that? What? Blue moon's over here. It's, this, it's that kind of professional level of preparation on my part you all come to expect. G, Okay, that's a growth rate. A growth rate can be something like 2% or 0 0.02. Okay. What that growth rate actually looks like, um, 
Well, actually, the reason that matters is something called the rule of 70. So what the rule of 70 says is that living standards double. Increase by 70 over x, where x is your living standards increase by 70 over x, where x is your uh, growth rate. So for example, example, let's, do, let's not call it x, let's call it g. Okay, if g is 0.02, it's 2%, then living standards double in 20, in 35 years. in 70 over 2, 35 years. Now increase G to 10, 10% a year, which is not, by the way, un uncommon. Living standards double in 7 years. Okay? That's, that's an incredibly powerful thing. Why? The answer is compound. So think about, think about a, 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 a poor country. Think about a poor country. If you build roads, sewage, basic buildings, and you give people an education, okay? You can, you can compound it because countries that don't have roads tend to have really, really bad other things. For example, education. So building roads between one city and another that are really high quality helps trade. Trade helps increase wages. If wages are higher, people send their kids to school more. If their kids are go to school more, then they, they, they're more educated, they get better jobs, the economy becomes better, and so on and so forth. Can you see that there, there are these multiplier and accelerator effects that push the economy forward, okay? So my point is that the, what, they all influence one another. They all influence one another. They keep, they, they, they keep each other up. Okay? Now, the way you think about growth rates in, in, in sort of reality is that it's the GDP of the economy at time t okay? minus the GDP of the economy at time t minus 1, all divided by the economy at times GDP t minus 1, multiplied by 100. <coughs> so, for example, if the economy produces, um, I don't know, uh, 105 units of apples in a, in a given year, and last year it made 100, you divide that by 100, and you get a 5% growth rate. Okay? The G, so, so the growth was 5% over time. That's what I mean by growth rate. It's really important that I that I that I, that, I, that, I, that you understand what these this G is. Okay, it's really understand that, that you understand what this G yoke is. You know, you're the head off Tom Cruise. Okay, <laughs> thank you, uh, Zenu. Thanks you. Cool. Oh, fair enough. Thank you. Um, I think. Maybe? I don't know. Anyway. All right. Uh, <coughs> uh, what are we talking about? Yeah, so 5% growth. So that's what that G means. And the reason that matters is because of these, these compounding effects. Okay? The reason that it matters is because of these compounding effects. Um, and if you don't have them, you're going to be in trouble, basically. So think about this a little bit. Think about this a little bit. You want growth. You want growth. Okay? Growth is a good thing. But it is true that you don't get growth for everybody at the same time. You definitely don't. It's not the case that you get growth for everybody at the same time. Okay? Definitely not. Um, the truth about it is that it tends to be the case that when rich people get get wealthy, they tend to trickle it down to other people. So growth is unevenly distributed. This is one of the key learning outcomes for today. Distribute. Growth is unevenly distributed. So this is the Howard Dilma model. It says that the growth rate of capital, okay, divided by the level of capital, G, 
is equal to the savings rate times the capacity utilization rate. Capacity utilization. So when you think about capacity utilization, think about our pizza man and his factory, yeah? Capacity utilization is you can produce 100 pizzas an hour, but you're only producing 80. So you're at 80% capacity, so you would be 0.8, yeah? So what do you think the capacity utilization for our economy looks like now? It could produce a huge amount of stuff, but it doesn't because there's a 15% unemployment rate. So clearly it doesn't produce everything that it could. The capacity utilization rate for Ireland is around 75% right now. What's the savings rate like in Ireland right now? Pretty good actually, it's pretty good. So for Ireland, U is like 0.75. And, and S is about, let's say it's uh, uh, 0.14. That means the growth rate, the warranted growth rate, is going to be 0.14 times 0.75. Yeah? And what it's telling you is, if you increase capacity, capacity utilization, if you increase U, then G goes up. Yeah? If you increase capacity, capacity utilization, then G goes up. What? This is all very exciting, but what's the policy relevance from this? What is, what is this? How does this matter in the real world? What this is telling you is that there's a role for, for activist policy, which is getting people back to work. If you increase capacity utilization or decrease the savings rate, you're going to increase the growth rate. That's the, the lesson from the Howard Domer model. Okay? That's the lesson. And that helps us explain something about Ireland right now. Another story that we, we can tell that is very interesting is the neoclassical story. The neoclassical story looks like this. Okay? It says that the savings rate times the capacity utilization is actually equal to the growth rate of the labor force. Yeah? The growth rate of the labor force. So how quickly the labor force increases. How quickly the labor force increases. This is, a, this is another, again, important point. How quickly does the labor force increase? Well, it doesn't increase at the rate of the babies being born this year, does it? No, because babies don't get put straight to work. We have to wait, I don't know, what's the minimum, what's the minimum wage, the minimum age in Ireland? Is it 18? 16, right, we've got to wait 16 years? That's ridiculous. Start putting them put to work at eight or something. Yeah, let's start putting the kids to work at eight, and then we'll only have to wait, wait eight years. So there's a serious lag. <coughs> The growth rate of our labor force, it comes from two places. One, uh, the labor force, it comes from one, so babies born 16 years ago at T minus 16. Where else, where else do, uh, do uh, eligible workers come from? Where do they come from? Immigration. Immigration, sorry. We can import them. We also export them, obviously. Um, so it's, another, it's a nice way to do it, actually. They, they come fully formed. You don't have to spend money on Liga or anything like that. They just show up and they say, hello, we'd like to work, and you go, in you go. Be a doctor or whatever. Yeah, happy day. So that's a nice way to do it. So what, what's the policy outcome from this? Keep saving, keep saving reasonably low, keep capacity utilization reasonably high, but do your best to keep, ta keep, keep uh, labor mobility up. Allow people to come in if they want. Is Ireland an easy place to get a job if you're not from here? It's not that bad, actually. It's not brilliant, but it's not that bad. There are a lot, a lot, a lot of other places that are worse. Now, last week, we, we saw this kind of quite primitive growth accounting exercise. And the reason, that, the reason that I showed you this last week was what we were talking about, um, we were talking about uh, price formation. Here, and, and how, how companies really work. Here I'm talking about the entire economy. So this says that output is the sum of the price level times the amount of stuff that's produced, and that's equal to the wages you produce, wages you charge, times the labor you employ, plus the rent rate of capital times the price level times the amount of capital. So this thing here, output, <coughs> it's the value of output. This is the price level. This is the amount of output. This is 
the wage, the nominal wage or the real wage. And this is the um, amount of labor. Think about the number of workers. This is the rental cost of capital. This is the price level again, and this is the amount of capital. Amount of capital. Okay? Quite important. Quite an important point here. What this is saying is, <laughs> if, you, if you divide by P, it's telling you that X here, is the amount of output, is actually the number of workers times the amount of workers you have, the, the wage times the amount of workers, plus RK, the real cost of capital. Okay? So let's define two variables. One variable we'll call phi, that's this funny looking um, harp looking thing, right? We'll call that, and what we'll say is it is just the amount of workers you have divided by the amount of output. So the, the worker, this is the, the, if you think about it, this is, this is the worker's share of output. Yeah? W L R W. And since y is equal to px, by definition, you can rewrite it as wl over px. Okay? What this is telling you is, this is in some sense the wage share <coughs> of output. Okay? The wage share of output. Similarly, let's define another variable, pi, and this is just the um, uh, uh, capital's share of output. WL, not WL, RPK over Y. And then you do the same substitution, RPK over PX. This is capital's share of output. Share of output. Now you might go, well, what does that mean? Well, imagine that there are only two types of workers, in the, two, two types of people in the world. This is the total amount of output, Y. Okay? There's only two types of people. There's workers and there's capitalists. How do you know which type you are? How do you know if you're a worker or a capitalist? Are you, we, can, we, can, we can change the language. We can call you households and firms. <coughs> Same thing. How do you know? If you're the one who's paid and you're the one who's paying, that's the way to tell. Or if you make most of your income from capital gains, as opposed to most of your income from PAYE, then that's the difference. But at the end of the day, there's always a share. So this is the wage share, which we'll call phi. And this is the profit share, which we'll call phi. In the United States of America at the moment, the big problem, which uh, the Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz is constantly highlighting is, that there's a massive inequality. And the inequality comes from the fact that this essentially has increased. Profit's share of the pie is absolutely enormous. There are people in America who make 38,000 times the average wage in a given year. 38,000 times. I was listening to the... Um, I was listening to the... Uh, um, the radio this morning, and there's a, there's a song called I Want to Be a Billionaire, you know? And I was thinking, uh, it's a terrible song. It's a really bad song. Um, but uh, but uh, I was thinking, maybe 10 years ago, he wouldn't want to be a billionaire. He'd want to be a millionaire. It's a bit like the James Bond villains, you know? Now they want $10 trillion. 20 years ago, they wanted a billion dollars. And then 40 or 50 years ago, they wanted a million dollars. But it's simply a fact. That, la that labor is losing out to capital in this war. So now, you can define two things. The first is that when you add profit, profit's share and labor's share, you get one. That's because somebody has to get this in the pie. Secondly, and importantly, you can define productivity as the amount of output you get divided by the amount of capital. So productivity, is lambda with productivity. So you can divide that as x over k. I know this is a bit hard, folks, but just stay with me. Stay with me and, and, and you'll see something kind of remarkable. We we'll call this thing average labor productivity, that lambda thing there. Then, of course, if there's average labor productivity, there must, of course, be an average labor share. 
which is pi. And if there's an average labor share, then by definition, there's an average capital share. Yeah. So there's a capital share and a labor share. What defines the, the labor share? Two things. The first is the wage, W. The second is productivity. So if you are more productive, your wage share will go up. That's what this is telling you. That phi is equal to W divided by lambda. The second thing there is telling you about the average capital share. Pi is equal to R divided by U. Your capital share will go up if R goes up. In other words, the profits of being a, a capitalist go up. Or if capacity utilization goes up, if your factories are in more use. This is an incredibly important, it's slightly abstract, so I know you're not seeing it, but, but the next thing, I want you all to write this down, underline it, and sort of put, put circles around. This equation is called the two souls. The two souls equation. And it defines, if you like, the path of modern capitalism. W over lambda plus R over U is equal to one. This is the two souls equation. There are two souls of capitalism. Okay? Two souls after uh, Proust. Okay? And the two souls basically means at any time you have a battle. You have a battle between workers and you have a battle between capitalists. And sometimes the workers win and sometimes the capitalists win. Right now, do you think the workers are winning or the capitalists are winning? <coughs> Hands up who thinks the workers are winning. Here's the battle right now. There's an economic downturn. Hands up who thinks the workers are winning. Hands up who thinks the capitalists are winning. The entire class. Okay. The two souls. The two souls equation says any increase in labor productivity either comes by a jump in the real wage or a jump in the profit rate, which is, a, which is a sanitized way of saying, if I work harder, either you get the proceeds of my work or I do, okay? Productivity increases, always increases somebody's income. Please underline that. Productivity increases, always increases somebody's income. It sounds stupid, but it's true. It's true and it's incredibly important that you understand this, okay? So, I want you to think about this equation. This equation is called the solo model. What it tells you is, what it tells you is that the growth rate of X, which is the output, is just productivity times the growth rate of labor plus the profit share times the growth rate of capital. So what you're, what you're saying is the way to grow an economy Okay, what Solo is saying is, the way to grow the economy, and I can show you this in many different ways, but this is the idea. This is it boiled down to its essence. Growth rate of output, which is growth, that's just phi, the, the, the labor share. So x dot is just phi plus growth rate of L plus pi, which is the capital share, times the growth rate of capital, plus something which we'll call surplus. You may have heard of something called total factor productivity. I think that's what Dr. Palchik was talking about with you last year. If you saw total factor productivity, that's what this surplus is. So how do you get the economy to grow? How do you get the economy to grow? Okay. How do you get the economy to grow? Either you get workers to work harder or you make your capital better. That's what it's telling you. Now, the Caldor model is even nicer. It says the growth rate of the capital stock is just the employment growth plus the labor productivity growth. So all you have to do, what Caldor is saying, Nicholas Caldor, he's saying, listen, these are all stories. And what's, what Caldor is saying is this is what you need to do. Just make sure that people can work the best. And he has a series of really cool stylized facts, which I'll leave you to go through. Romer and Jones updated Caldor's work recently. And here's what they said was, the extent of the market needs to be explained. Hang on, folks. I can hear people starting to rustle. Two more minutes. Accelerating growth. Growth is increasing at an increasing rate. 
and there are variations in modern growth rates. Okay? So, the new stylized fact, we've increment uh, TFP differences, increases in human capital per worker, and the long-run stability of wages. Now, the way to understand this is via something called Jones Banana. And I'll tell you all about Jones Banana next week. Hang on a second. Could you add this paper to your website? Okay. Nice. Okay. Hi. Pardon? Yes? Money. Yes, yes. Sure. Yeah, there's, there's this one I did, the last one. Okay. And after doing everything, sure. you know, it will automatically tell you it's in that. Yes. And I got 50%, uh, meaning that oh. you got a zero, wouldn't it? No, you don't get a zero, we'll just look at it. 